little bit of background, a little bit of background as to how this topic came about. And then we're going to jump straight in. So we've had at Euphoria the privilege of working in one of the largest conservation areas in our country with the rangers of um, that park. And we've been working with them on a long-term change process, which has to do with moving them from a place where they've had to, in especially from 2012 to 2020, militarize, become a military conservation um, group, specifically because of poaching, um, to now being in a place in terms of rhino poaching where it's still an issue and it's still happening, but at much less of a scale. So people who were conservationists and became a paramilitary force have to remember how to be conservationists again. At the end of a period of time that's been massively impactful on them in terms of their own uh, levels of trauma, their mental health, uh, relationships as a result. And um, that's not just at work, but at home as well. And these are the, some of the most amazing people I've ever worked with. Now, as part of that program, which um, we're supporting a much larger organizational change program in, we've had the privilege of doing Enneagram work with these rangers at lots of different levels. And we taught them the Enneagram and then just asked the question, so what animals and animal behaviors do you see inside the different Enneagram types. So most of what you're going to see today has nothing to do with my wisdom around the Enneagram or what we do in Euphoria, but has everything to do with what people say uh, that work in conservation directly. So much of this is from them. The interesting piece is when I asked this question, the first thing they asked is, do you want the real deal or do you want the Disney version of animals? And um, I said, no, let's let's do the real deal here. Um, so none of the ideas you have around animals that you get from our um, scrubbed versions of reality that maybe come from Disney are in play. Uh, we are talking about what is really happening. Um, and at times they've been very specific. So they've said things like, this is an elephant matriarch's behavior. It's not elephants in general. So we're just rolling with this. And sometimes we'll talk about animals in general. Sometimes we'll talk a little bit more about specific behaviors at specific points in their life cycle. But I want to give great thanks to the rangers that we've been working with for, for their wisdom that they are gifting the Enneagram community. So thanks to them and to their wonderful leader, who's one of the most inspirational people I've ever worked with. By the way, the person heading up ranger services is a woman. And she has 450 people um, that are rangers that work with her. So brilliant, brilliant woman. So how we're going to do today is I'm going to share a little bit of theory around the instincts and the 27 subtypes. We'll go into a short breakout. And then when we come back, we look at the animals, just so that those of us that are more familiar with um, the instincts can also share some of our ideas about how the instincts work with people who are newer to the Enneagram and newer to working with the instincts. So without much further ado, let's get going because there's lots of interesting videos that we wanna see. So in terms of working with the um, instincts, first thing, let's just get two quotes out there. The first is from uh, the wonderful Russ Hudson, who says, your life is a temple to your dominant instinct. So the key thing around the instincts is we don't always know that we've built a temple um, to in some way worship our dominant instinct. It really operates at a subconscious, at an instinctual level. And you might not be aware until you start doing some inner work how much of your life is arranged around that instinct. So then the second thing that I want to share is something that I've been using a lot in teaching uh, the Enneagram. And that is People often say, so why are the instincts important? So firstly, it is important to help you understand the variation of your Enneagram type. So uh, we'll work with the subtypes today. But the piece that I see quite a lot in working with people is that dominant instinct 
the instinct that's most ingrained in our profiles is the instinct that often it's like pinging on a radar screen without us knowing it, saying this thing is the thing that's going to get you into trouble. And if we catastrophize this all the way, this thing is the thing that's potentially going to kill you. Yeah. And then we have the blind instinct. So that's the least developed instinct and the least developed instincts are not even pinging on the radar screen as threats. And then they are the ones that actually get us into trouble. So let's take a clear example of this. If I'm dominant in the self-preservation instinct, then subconsciously it's pinging on my radar screen all the time with alerts going, you're going to get into real trouble if you don't have enough food, if you don't have enough water, if you don't sleep enough. And so my whole life, as Russ says, gets organized around that instinct. But it's even more insidious than that. In some way, it's saying the thing that's going to kill you is that instinct. In the social instinct, politics in your family, in your tribe, in your organization, in your community, that's the thing that's going to absolutely ruin you. And then if I'm dominant social, I'm not paying attention to either self-praise or sexual or maybe both of those. And they are the ones that actually get us into trouble because they're sneaking into the threat zone without pinging on our radar screen. So that's um, a little bit around how these things work. So the three instincts, self-preservation, social, and sexual, or one-to-one, -one. the self-preservation instinct, are it's really based on the evolutionary biological needs for food, for shelter, for the things that preserve our um, physical well-being, our mental well-being, our spiritual well-being. Um, I love Mario Sakura's language, the preserving instincts. He's turned it into uh, thinking of them as um, as you know, more in terms of verbs than nouns. So the preserving instinct is what we've got there. The social instinct is, I think, the most misunderstood instinct in many ways. The social instinct often is seen as something to do with wanting to be in groups, liking being in groups. No. The social instinct or the navigating instinct is the instinct that tells me how to navigate tribes groups, systems. I might not be enjoying that much, but I have the sense that the group and not knowing what the rules are or not figuring out how to find my belonging in this group, that's the thing that's going to get me deep in trouble. So that's what the dominant navigating instinct. And then the sexual instinct, the one-to-one -one instinct, also often misunderstood. It's called the transmitting instinct by Mario. The um, sexual instinct or transmitting instinct is all about forming intimacy and intimate bonds in order for us to procreate. But a lot of my attention here goes to um, attracting and transmitting those intimate bonds. And that might not only be with partners who are potential sexual or life partners. This can also be with my intimate friends. And it's the instinct that is, amongst other things, um, responsible for a lot of our charisma, and our relationship with intensity. Now, uh, one small piece of theory before we jump in. Um, understanding the instincts, some thoughts from John Lukovic's book, which I like quite a lot around uh, the instincts. And here, just some ideas. What are the energies associated with each of these instincts? How do I tune it down if it's dominant, if it's pinging on the radar screen all the time? Or how do I tune it up if blind? So the self-preservation is a grounding or sensing or pragmatic energy. And if I need to tune it down, I need to get uncomfortable more often, um, especially in terms of my physical well-being. I need to uh, find ways of enjoying what I'm doing and not efforting, let go of some of the hypersensitivity that I might have, build my flexibility. If it, I need to pay more attention to my basic needs, I need to look at um, self-care, I need to pay more attention to logistics and planning, money, resources, exercise and health. And this might be different for different people, also in different life phases. Now, if I'm self-praised blind and you looked at me at 25, um, some of the stuff around exercise and health may not have been on the radar screen in the same way it is now 
um, that I'm in my late 40s. Then the social instinct, which is the all of us together, the community, the tribe instinct, how do I navigate that? Here, a lot of my energy goes to checking availability, politics, signaling, navigating what's going on there. If I need to tune it down because it's too dominant, I need to focus more on personal things and less on the group things, less politics and gossip, less about what are, what's my role here? How do I work with that? I might need to become more boundaried. It's different for different people. And if it's blind, read the politics more, become more aware of norms, um, convene or build community more around you so that you don't end up isolated. You can also look at building traditional culture and ways in which you signal or communicate into the larger community. And then the you and I, um, instinct, the sexual or one-to-one -one instinct, the search for intimacy. Here, a lot of the energy goes to, towards the pursuit of others. Charisma, magnetism, intensification. If it's dominant for you, maybe you want to figure out if being less provocative is a good idea, less intense, less possessive, less of a spectacle, maybe more moderate and calm. And if you need to tune it up because it's blind, you can connect more to others in that intimate space, build your intimacy, your charisma, presence. So a lot of coaching presence work helps us to attune to some of this instinct as well, transmitting our learning um, and adding energy and broadcasting into the world. Um, I guess for those of you that don't know me well, you can guess my dominant instinct, definitely the one-on-one -on -one instinct, my blind instinct is self-preservation. What gets me into trouble? Self-praise over and over and over again. But I overread what's happening in the dynamics between me and the people that are closest to me. So that gives you an idea of how that works. Now, if we look at the theory around how the, the Enneagram subtypes form, there's a basic formula and that's basically take the passion or the vice of the type. So that's kind of the the lower emotional center of the type, add it to the motivation of the type and you get the instinctual subtype. An example of this would be, I've used Enneagram one. Enneagram one has that addiction to anger, except we don't call it anger, we call it frustration because anger isn't proper, is it? Say our Enneagram ones. And then the motivation of the type is the need to be a good, and responsible person that gets things right rather than a lazy, irresponsible person that makes mistakes, that's a bad person that goes bad in some way. Now, in different ways, when the anger meets the instincts, so anger, frustration turned inwards into my preservation instinct, creates the Enneagram 1 subtype that's called worry. I'm concerned about getting things right and perfecting things myself. If I merge that with a social instinct, now I'm trying to perfect how the social system, the tribe, the world around me works. And this is called rigidity. I'm making rules and I'm pulling out my holy finger all the time to tell people how things should be. And then, um, and I'm not, I'm not budging much on any of those things. So perfection and social instinct together give us that. And then if we look at this desire for perfection, the need to be good, together with the one-to-one, -one, the transmitting instinct, this gives me the evangelists of the Enneagram, uh, zeal, the people who go, this is how the world should work, but don't look in my own closet. Um, and the most openly angry of all of the um, Enneagram one types. Now, we also know that one of these combos for each of the types, and it's different in the different types, creates what we call the unusual or the counter version of the type. The uh, one to one, one, so the sexual one is the unusual version of this, because here I'm not so much interested in perfecting my own world, but I'm broadcasting it so that others can perfect the world. So the analogy sometimes self praise one, um, makes their own cupboard perfect, their own clothes cupboard. Perfect. There's a system. It has to do with color coding and whatever it is, but there's a system and it's their system. And they're happy with their system. Don't mess with their system, but it's theirs. The think goes, this is the system. And in true Marie Kondo fashion, everyone should use this system. 
this is how I do it. You should do it too. And I get quite upset with everyone around me who's not following the system. And then the sexual ones go, this is the system that you should follow. Just don't look in my own closet because I'm not following it myself. Um, so that's kind of the broad idea that we have here. So what we're going to do before we jump into the animal subtypes is we're just going to have a short, and you don't have to go into it in too much detail, but a short one uh, uh, breakout group for 10 minutes. Sharice is setting that up for us. And in that group, you can just share with each other what's your dominant instinct, if you know what it is. Um, and what's the implication of the, this obsession that you have with this instinct at a subconscious level? What's the implication of that? And then what instinct is blind for you? And maybe it's one, maybe it's two of them. How does this blind instinct get you into trouble? And then when we come back, more about the animal kingdom. So, um, Sharice, if you can pop people into breakouts, it's just a short breakout of 10 minutes. Get to know the other people here from across the world, and we'll see you back here in 10 minutes. Okay, the, uh, you'll be swift off, swept, swept off into rooms in um, one, two, three. Please select uh, the room uh, button if it comes up on your screen. Great, so welcome back in the main room. Um, hopefully that was just a connection into the topic for you before we get into the animal kingdom. Um, so if there are any questions left over, we're not going to get sidetracked into an hour long discussion around the instincts and it is possibly one of the most controversial topics in the Enneagram community. So we're not going down that rabbit hole. I wonder if the rabbit is somewhere on this. Who knows? Uh, but if you have any questions that you feel we can't continue if you don't get them answered, please pop them in the chat box. Um, Tessa, we'll do one one spoken, but the rest, while well, the rest of them type. So just unmute yourself. What's your question, Tessa? You're on mute. Hello, hello. In our group, Lucille, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I don't know why I'm doing many thumbs up, sorry. Um, we were trying to figure out what you meant by the blind instinct and where we would find that on our report. Is it just the instinct that came up as the lowest? Yeah, as okay. simple as that. And the lower it is, the blinder it is. Yeah? Got it. So yes. if you've got one of those minus twos on an instinct or whatever, that's pretty blind. But if both, if you have two that are pretty low, then possibly both of them are blind. It's your lowest instinct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the one that you know. need, to, need to do the most. And this is where top of everything is great. But therapy helps so blind and neglected that they don't ping on the radar screen. Um, and I also, I work with like really, really basic reminders around my low self press, like little notes on my computer screen that says, remember to have food, because if I don't, I get hangry mm. and then everything is a whole lot of crap later on in the day. Okay. Mm. So, Lucia, um, sorry, would that help with, then with ever changing your instinct or just your main instinct or at least evening them out a little bit? Because like okay. I don't like my main one. Yeah. So what happens when we work very deliberately on an instinct is it evens them out a bit. Of course, because our instincts, what's the purpose of the instincts? The purpose of the instincts is to help us navigate the challenges in our life, right? So they're instinctually there to protect us from, a, uh, from an evolutionary perspective. So they do like come into frame in response to the challenges that we have, but then we've got this baseline programming that um, is more consistent. 
So um, Joe wants to know, what did I mean by the dominant instinct will kill you? We think that's the thing that will get us. If I'm dominant self-praise, my radar screen is constantly telling me, you're going to die if you don't have enough food. You're going to die if you don't sleep enough. You're going to die if your health is not good. And so you're almost obsessed with it because it's pinging all the time saying, danger lives here. Yeah. But I'm paying so much attention to it that I'm not paying enough attention to the stuff happening in my blind spot. And that's the instincts that are not covered by radar screen. Hopefully, Joe, that makes a bit more sense. Okay, let's get into this animal kingdom thing. Now, I don't think all of this is a perfect science. You know, a lot of you that work with the Enneagram might have very different ideas around this. As I said before, this is what the rangers from one of our national parks here in South Africa say that work with animals all the time. Um, not all the animals are South African. And sometimes we're talking about birds as well. One or two of them I had to go look up because I didn't know what they were talking about. And so it's been wonderfully educational along the way. We are going to start with Enneagram 8 as our space. And what I'd like you to do, just a couple of things. We will share this presentation afterwards, as always. So you don't have to take a million screenshots. But what is really useful, it's a nice little exercise. It's called build your animal totem pole. And that's basically if you know what your trifix is, so your highest Enneagram type in each of your centers, look out for the animal that corresponds with that. So I am an Enneagram 4 with a sexual instinct. So I'm going to look at the 4SX for me. But the rest of my trifix is 4, 8, 5. So I'm going to look at 8 SX and I'm going to look at 5 SX too. And then I'm going to build my little animal totem pole. And I'm going to say, what lives in my head center? I've given you some clues maybe. What lives in my heart center? And what lives in my gut center? And some of the curiosities about my personality might be explained by the weird ways in which those three animals cohabit. So you can almost imagine what would happen if these three animals were to live together um, <laughs> and see, see, that's the kind of interesting side project you can be running here. Um, if you know your trifix, if you don't know your trifix, um, you can always go look it up in your um, AIM reports. It's on the results page that says you're an Enneagram 4, and then it says with this instinct, and then it says with these three numbers in the trifix. Okay, Enneagram 8. This is what our rangers said. They said that the Enneagram 8 with a self-preservation instinct is like the honey badger. And for those of you in the Northern Hemisphere that aren't as familiar with the honey badger, it's a bit different to a badger. Let's just say that up front. So the honey badger, it's also maybe a little bit like a wolverine. The social eight, which is the unusual version of the Enneagram eight, is like the elephant matriarch. And the one-to-one, -one, the sexual eight, is like the black rhino. Now, here's a couple of things that I can tell you about each of these animals, and then we'll just Look at short bits of video clips so you can see the behavior in action. The honey badger is a tiny creature, right? I've come face to face with one of them on a walk in the Neisner forest. They are fierce, despite being as tiny as they are. They take on animals that are 10 times, 20 times their size, and they win. And if they um, sometimes we use the analogy that the self press eight is a little bit like a tank. You know, they don't necessarily signal that they're going to run over you, but they just run over you slowly if you get between them and their needs. And the honey badger is that same thing. If you get between them and whatever it is that they're going for, they're going to viciously go through you. And then that's the end of that. The matriarch um, of the elephant herd is most of the time, I mean, people see elephants as, I think, incredibly wise, calm, beautiful. They herd animals. So there we have the social instinct in play. 
But the elephant matriarch can go from being totally caring and taking care of little elephants to literally going straight over trees and storming as if, yeah, they're as aggressive as a big predator would be. And they can be absolutely fearless in protection of their herd. And what we know of the social instinct is um, many people who have the dominant social instinct, for example, I've seen part of their, their stories is like, for example, being a woman who has this strong Enneagram 8 but I grow up in a culture that's more patriarchal and that doesn't allow for women to be as strong as my natural inclination is. So I learn how to go. I smile, I wave, I'm friendly. And a lot of people would say, you know, they look a bit like an Enneagram too. How can they be an Enneagram eight? And then there's that moment where the social eight says, you touch my children, you die. <laughs> You touch my team and I'll take you out. And from that friendly space, you know, kind of the repressed um, passion of the Enneagram 8, they can go into war mode in an instant. So there we have the matriarch elephant. And then the black rhino <laughs> and the sexual 8. So the sexual 8 is called possession. And one of the things that we learned um, when we were working, uh, walking in the Amphalosi on the Wild Self Trail uh, with my wonderful friend Karine, who's here today as well, is we learned that the black rhinos, well, firstly, they have terribly bad tempers. Let's just say that. White rhinos, much nicer to walk around with. So while we were walking, the guides were saying, if we come across the white rhinos, that's cool. Just, you know, they don't have great eyesight. So stay calm, stay centered everything shall be well. But if there's a black rhino and they get a, a sense of us, we will give you instructions on how to get out of the way and you better follow them. Because black rhinos um, are a lot more temperamental. They can be a lot scarier. And here's the interesting thing. They eat, amongst other things, the seeds of the Datura plant. Now, the Datura plant is a, quite a poisonous plant. It's a very big medicine plant, and the black rhinos apparently eat it all the time. And so we don't really know, are they just bad tempered or are they on a bad high part of the time? Um, so the black rhino, very fierce, very scary, don't mess with it. Um, and it will also be incredibly, um, yeah, incredibly aggressive when you directly challenge it and it doesn't want to be challenged, but does all kinds of weird things as our sexual subtypes sometimes get into trouble with. So what I'm going to do is, and I, I want to just give you a, a small disclaimer before we start. I've got some videos of each of these animals. I'm not going to play the whole video clip, so I might just skip it forward a little bit. Most of the clips are two or three minutes long. Some of them are amateur footage of animals. So it's not going to look like a David Attenborough documentary. I have David Attenborough once or twice. But every now and then you will come across something that's a little bit more grainy, but it's going to give you an idea of what's going on there. And yeah, let's just see if you have any thoughts that come up, any observations about apes and these animals, please feel free to pop them in the chat box as we go along. So the first one we're going to look at the self press. This is our honey badgers. Honey badgers and wolverines may look harmless when compared to lions or tigers, but they are just as fierce. In fact, the Guinness Book of World Records says that honey badgers are the most fearless animal in the world. They can go up against a wide variety of creatures, some of whom are many times their own size. Wolverines, on the other hand, are predators with an exceptional sense of smell. They can even detect prey burrowing under 20 feet of snow. Have you seen a wolverine go up against a wolf? What about a fight between honey badgers and vicious wild dogs? Today, we present to you 15 fearless moments of honey badgers. 14. Honey badger versus snakes. Honey badgers also go up against poisonous and smaller snakes frequently. Since these snakes make up their diet, honey badgers have developed a strong natural immunity against most snake venom. 
This allows the predators to become further fearless in their battles with vipers. Watch this amazing clip where a honey badger decides to chase a Cape Cobra up a tree. The snake tries to escape by flinging itself down from the tree's branch, but the honey badger is lightning fast and gets back down immediately to go after its prey. It pounces and bites into the snake's head, eliminating it. In this clip, the honey badger's target is this mole snake. Although non-venomous, these snakes have a powerful bite. The serpent lashes out and strikes the badger first, but the honey badger isn't deterred, even after several more bites. The mole snake quickly realizes that this is a fight it cannot win. It tries to flee, but the badger quickly grabs its tail. Then, it delivers the killing bite on the snake's head and sits down. Okay, so that's the honey badger. It takes on, you can see there, lions, wild dogs. It chases buffaloes. It takes on snakes. And they do that so often that they actually have anti-venom in their bodies because of their relationship that how often they get bitten by the snakes. There are versions of honey badgers that... Um, that get bitten by, uh, for example, a Cape Cobra, and then they lose their capacity to move for a couple of minutes, and then they recover, and they go on. That's what happens when you get between the self press 8 and whatever they're going for. They might have a moment of a setback, but they get straight back up and they keep going. Let's take a look now um, at the elephant matriarch. And... Um, what she does, so this is amateur footage. It's an example of an elephant matriarch um, whose herd is being attacked by some wild dogs. So let's take a look at that. Dog is the one leading. There she comes. Oh. <laughs> Straight through the tree. Oh. <laughs> no, she's not going to come at us, guys. Amazing how they stick together as a group and the matriarch leading in the front, the little calves in the middle. Look at the tiny one all huddled up there. All protected. All protected. So do you see what happened there? The herd was coming through, the wild dogs were there. She went from being with the herd, storming over a tree, chasing them away, to going back to not even ear flapping, none of that, being with the herd having her moment with the herd. And she's not storming randomly. It's just really where the threat is. And then I go back to being mommy elephant and taking care in a very powerful way of the herd. Our last example we're going to have here is we're going to look at our um, black rhinos. And I am suddenly struggling to see where my black rhinos are. So I am going to have to show you the black rhino video later because it's not in my uh, space anymore. But you can um, find out more about the black rhinos. I'll find that link and I'll pop it in the chat for all of you. So yeah, that's the Enneagram 8s. Any Enneagram 8s that have a quick comment? Uh... <laughs> So now we're going to move on to our Enneagram nines. Um, and I did not go, and this is the interesting thing, our rangers did not go for a low blow. They did not go for the sloth in any kind of way. So here are our three ways of expressing fusion that comes from the rangers. First, in the self praise nine category, we have the panda bear. Now, panda bears eat 
a lot of bamboo. And I think when they're not eating bamboo, they're sleeping. And um, so that idea of merging with my, um, merging with my physical appetite as a way of calming my system down. What we know with the Enneagram Nines is they don't like conflict. They want harmony. And so that need for harmony is just with the instinct. self praise instinct means I want my body to feel a little bit like a great carbohydrate uh, nap. And so that's part of where that idea of use my appetite to calm my body down. And then I, I don't have to deal with the conflict as much. It doesn't affect me as much. The social nine, uh, which here is the giraffe, it's called participation. So interestingly, the social nines are the unusual version of nine. They sometimes look a little bit like Enneagram 3s. They can be workaholics. They don't stop. And this is their way of maintaining harmony. If I'm constantly serving the team or my family or my community, then no one's going to fight with me. So I am working very hard to keep things going. Now, interestingly, uh, Amangili, I see your hand and I'll get there in a moment. Interestingly, with the giraffes, uh, giraffes fight. Um, uh, they don't fight often and they fight with their necks so they're quite awkward at fighting but it can be quite vicious and what we see with giraffes and their aggression is as we know with Enneagram 9s it's like the fuse goes many times around the building but when it explodes it's actually quite scary uh, but it's also a bit awkward so we'll see how the Enneagram uh, 9 with the social instinct is like a giraffe and then what our Kruger Rangers said is that the one-to-one -one instinct, the sexual instinct, is a little bit more like the kudus. And kudus are one of the largest antelopes that there are. They have very interesting behaviors, so we learn a little bit more about them. What we know with the one-to-one -one, uh, nines is here they fuse with a significant other. And the fusion goes, if I want everything you want as my significant other or as my best friend, we never have to have disagreement. We never have to have conflict. So by fusing with your needs, um, that helps me maintain the harmony that I want. Um, yeah. Abungile, you had a question. I don't know if it's still uh, and, relevant. No, sorry. No, the, the hand was ra uh, raised by mistake. So okay, I'll, I'll fabulous. <laughs> no problem. So let's look at some of the Enneagram 9 videos um, to get a sense of it. Some of those animals' behavior you may know better than others. And let me just line that up. We'll start with the panda bear. And um, yeah, they are curious creatures. I am married to a panda bear, so I don't know what he's going to think about this. Um, sorry, I have just momentarily lost the right thing that I want to do. Here we go. idea with that one um so our panda bears they eat they sleep they sleep they eat and of course that's not how self praise nines are but that's self praise nines under pressure when i'm feeling dysregulated in my system i have to go nap i have to find a way of calming my nervous system down now let's take a look at our giraffes 
these are our social nines. And interesting for them, just note a little bit about, um, for example, the, be the relationship with sleep, which is very different to our pandas. Social nines, the unusual version of the nine. With their towering height and signature long necks, giraffes are some of the most iconic creatures of Africa. Giraffes are the tallest living land animals. Adult females can grow over 14 feet tall and adult males can reach over 18 feet. Baby giraffes called calves are born six feet tall and may grow an additional inch every day during their first week. This exceptional height allows giraffes to eat leaves and buds from treetops, unreachable by other animals, and to look out for predators and other oncoming dangers. Giraffes have exceptionally strong hearts. Their hearts are about two feet long and weigh approximately 25 pounds. That's equal to about 50 human hearts. Because of the great distance between a giraffe's heart and its brain, due to the animal's long neck, its heart has evolved thick muscular walls. Thanks to these powerful walls, a giraffe's blood pressure can be two times higher than many other animals. This helps the giraffe's heart defy gravity and push blood up its long neck and into its brain. Giraffes have the same number of neck bones as humans. Male giraffe's necks may also be used in fights over females and to establish a hierarchy within the herd. Giraffes are capable of sleeping only five minutes a day. Giraffes can survive on five to 30 minutes of sleep each day, which they get through a series of one to two minute naps. They can even get their rest while standing. Giraffes sleep this way out of necessity. They devote 16 to 20 hours each day to eating, which leaves little time for much else. Plus, sleeping, especially while lying down, exposes giraffes to predators. Okay. There's some really cool stuff around giraffes. What I love about giraffes, in part, is very much like the Enneagram 9. They've got these massive hearts. And Enneagram 9s, as we know in general, are part of the relationship before task Enneagram styles. But then this idea, like, I'm using my long neck to keep things safe, to keep my herd safe. I'm also using my neck to fight to establish the, the rank inside my tribe. Um, and then I don't sleep because it's too dangerous. So I keep working, just like our social nines do. Fascinating. And then lastly, in our nine space, we're also going to look at the kudu and um, learn a little bit more about them. So um, let's take a look at our kudus. Turtle animals, and it's not unheard of for these antelope to live within close proximity of human dwellings, but avoid detection. They're shy and elusive. Predators to kudus include wild dogs, leopards, lions, hyenas, and more. Upwards of 50% of kudu babies don't make it to their first birthday, but those that do learn to avoid predators by jumping six feet or more in the air and hiding in thickets. These antelopes depend on plants not just for camouflage, but also food and water. Kudus eat leaves, fruits, and other herbaceous material. Most of their water comes from this, but during the dry season, they stick close to forest rivers so they have an easy source of water. Outside of the dry season, they may venture further from water sources, but they're always found in areas with cover. Female kudus are often seen in small herds of a few other females, sometimes relatives, and their offspring. Male kudus can form bachelor groups, but the older they are, the more solitary they tend to be. 
The adults don't typically join each other outside of the breeding season. Male kudus have impressive spiraling horns that can reach more than three feet long in greater kudus and about two feet long in lesser kudus. These develop over time, and by the time the males reach about five years of age, they're large enough to push their weight around. Kudus are considered quite gentle in their matches. Males often settle disputes without even touching each other. They simply stand near each other and decide who is bigger. When they do lock horns, it's most often over breeding rights to a group of females. It's unusual for injuries to occur during these matches. However, there have been reports of males getting their horns stuck together in a fatal embrace. A female kudu gestates about six... So some interesting things about the kudus. I love that. Even when they fight it, they don't necessarily fight. They just stand next to each other and they size each other up and that's seen as a really big fight. And then that idea of fusion, sometimes when we, when they do get involved in something more intimate, it feels like the horns can get intermingled with each other. And that intermingling of horns can be fatal. And that's what fusion can sometimes do. We lose ourselves completely in the other and we get totally interlocked like that. But generally they eat herbs, they eat plants, they eat grasses, they're not very... Um, competitive in that kind of way and um, yeah when they are going to fight it's going to be in the space of intimacy so remember with the one-to-one -one types it's always what's the thing that's going to really kill me oh the stuff that goes wrong in my intimate relationships um, and so there we go our Enneagram nines feel free to give us some thoughts about your animals and what you think of them uh, they are quite a, a different bunch. Um, and maybe you can do that in the chat box because I'm scared we're going to run out of time. So Helen, Sari, I see you. We'll come back to things afterwards if we have a bit more time. Let's go to our Enneagram 1s, the last of the, um, the gut types. And here the Rangers came up with birds. All three of them are birds. So the self pres nine. So here I want to make things perfect. And it gets channeled into perfecting and making things right in my own personal space. We're going to look at the hornbill. And in particular, the behavior of the hornbill when they uh, need to lay their eggs and take care of their very young little hornbill chicks. The social nines, you get geese. And uh, some of the things that the ranger said, they said geese can be incredibly organized. They can have these beautiful V structures that they use to fly great distances. And when you get them on the ground, they can be incredibly irritable, They're very irritable creatures. And they can be quite grumpy and they make a lot of noise. They honk, honk, honk. This is the right way to do things. Why aren't you all flying in the perfect V with us? And then for our one-to-one -one nines, we've got weaver birds. And weaver birds are birds that build little nests. Uh, the, the males have to build these nests for the females. And then when the females don't like it because it's not to their liking, even though they've not built it, they break the nest apart. And so this thing of always... Uh, the female is maybe a little bit more like that. This is how I want my nest. No, not like that. And she's not doing the building herself, but she's getting the male to do all the hard work. Now here, the one-to-one -one nine is generally seen as the slightly unusual nine, more openly angry, whereas the self-present social nines are more irritable um, and frustrated with the world rather than openly angry. But that's the addiction or the vice of the nine is anger itself. So let's take a look at some of these animals. Uh, we'll start with the hornbill. They are absolutely fascinating if you are not familiar with hornbills. So here we go. I, I don't know. This is amazing. I didn't know this until they shared some of this with me. Okay. He has turned the tree hole into a predator-proof fortress. Her partner, however, is a regular 
visitor. For the next two months, he will deliver all her food directly to her door. So what we know about Enneagram ones, incredibly hard working. So always, so I've worked with Enneagram ones, um, especially a, a self praise one who worked so hard that eventually she fell asleep behind the steering wheel and crashed her car. Um, luckily she survived, and that's when she started coaching after that because she realized she was so she was taken down, up and up and up down it's also worry that can look a little bit sexish say so i want to create the perfect condition in which i can keep my little chick safe and so i'm going to pluck out my feathers i mean that's like extreme versions of self-flagellation we sometimes get from the enneagram one pluck out my feathers hold myself up and my more compulsive behaviors that i get in unhealthy enneagram ones can create a prison through the amount of control and self-control that we are um, exerting on ourselves. So fascinating creatures. I'm not going to show you the goose video for long um, because it's pretty have to walk for a thousand miles through the desert repenting um it's called wild geese um so there's some of the wild geese that's part of this too but this is not a particularly wild goose here we go Okay, um, there were lots of videos of geese also storming different humans. Uh, and that's that idea of like, this is the right way that we need to do it. But it's Hong Kong, Kong. This is the right way. This is what we need to do. It's quite an irritable animal. And then the last of our Enneagram ones, we've got the little weaver birds and their nest building. So let's take a look at what they are doing. Keep in mind, like the female weaver bird than the male weaver bird, the male weaver bird might be a little bit more self prezzy but the female weaver bird telling the male bird what to do and what perfection looks like without trying to build the nest herself. Look, look at those interesting crafting nests they make. So in weavers, the males do the construction of the nest and the females come and appreciate the nest. If the females like the nest, then they can keep the nest. If the female doesn't like the nest, she moves on onto the next male partner. So if this nest is rejected, like this was rejected, I found it on the ground, it's abandoned and they have to either leave it or destroy it and start the process again. So weavers are very good at uh, architecture. They weave their nests and that's where the name weavers comes from. So this nest is made out of grass. It has uh, some, some leaves from trees. It has some bits of papyrus, which is very evident that we are near the wetland. It was poorly built. Clearly you can see it doesn't look nice at all. I would reject it as well. Right, so there we go. It's fascinating to see. We've got weaver birds in our wetlands. It's fascinating to see them use their beaks to also tie these knots. I mean, they're constantly knotting and tying the grass and weaving it. And I just love that video because I think the presenter might be a little bit one-ish too. Look, this isn't perfect. I would reject that too. So there we go. Our Enneagram ones, 
please feel free to pop some of your thoughts around uh, what you like and what you don't like about your animals. You've got birds. So very different to our more predatory, for example, Enneagram 8s. So from here, from the gut center, we're going to move into the heart center and look at our twos. And uh, what we have with the Enneagram 2 is basically three ways of winning you over so you like me. Um, and we'll start with oxpeckers. Oxpeckers are birds that um, hitch a ride with other stronger um, animals. Uh, they can be zebras, they can be uh, buffaloes, all kinds of animals, giraffes. And they're basically performing a service for the animals. So their services, they're eating up a lot of the parasites and things like that. Um, but it's interesting, they can also be a little bit vicious, like some self praised twos can be. Uh, when the the animal has a wound, it can do some things, but they, they do wonderful service. They, uh, they raise the alarm when there's predators near, uh, lots of interesting things that they do. But actually, they're along for the ride so that they can get all their food right there. It looks like service, like the self press twos, but actually the oxpeckers are looking out for themselves. So that's the unusual version of the two. The social two here, we've got the pack of wild dogs. They are fascinating creatures. Um, they are definitely very strong pack animals. They can run for miles and miles and miles and they work together as a pack to um to take prey down and so social twos are often our um they can be very powerful they can be leaders as enneagram twos and what the the ranger said it's not so much here the alpha of the wild dog pack but it's the rest of the wild pack that are serving and creating the cohesion um that give us the ambition, very ambitious hunters, some of the best hunters in Africa. And then the one-to-one, -to -one two, we've got the dog, the dog that really wins uh, different people over and even some animals. So here we've got the idea of the, the dogs being charming and friendly and that way in which they bring you the ball and they entice you to play with them. Um, and then you just can't help but love them. Um, I'm going through some of that at the moment with the puppy dog that we unexpectedly got as a gift for my son's 18th birthday. She's definitely seducing me into loving her. She's a little, tiny, ratty little dog. She's fabulous. She's been making a noise here behind me while we're uh, busy. So let's look at some of the videos around that. I'll start with the ox pecker. Um, and let's take a look at that. Uh, here we go. The Oxpecker, a small bird with a large part to play. It may only be little, but it spends its life in the company of giants. They feed on parasites that they find while grooming through the fur of their larger mammal hosts and are sometimes even seen in the ears feeding off earwax. However, their job does not end there. The Swahili name for the oxpecker is Askari wa Kifaru, which translates as the rhino's guard. With its sharp eyesight, the oxpecker is always the first to spot potential danger, and when it does, it gives off a shrill call that the mammals then respond to. This obviously applies to any host that the bird is sitting on, but is particularly useful for an endangered rhinoceros. Recent studies have shown that oxpeckers actually don't make any kind of a difference to the parasite load on the mammals. But then again, one less tick has got to be helpful. It's one less itchy spot to scratch. There is a slightly darker aspect to the oxpecker's feeding routine. If the animal is injured, the oxpecker will actually peck at the injury to feed off the blood and surrounding mucus that will be there. 
for the mammal host that is exceptionally uncomfortable and of course prevents the wound from healing and actually has the potential to create infection. Okay, so what is some of the dark side of Enneagram 2? We help, we think we're helping, but that help isn't really that helpful. Um, so that can definitely be part of that. Um, let us look at our next Enneagram 2 animal, which is the wild dog, just to give you a sense of that. For those of you that haven't been here in the African continent, an amazing pack animal um, and a very rare animal to actually spot and have interactions with. Um, one of the ways in which they bond in the pack is that they, they have incredibly stinky poo and then they roll in that. Um, <laughs> I've been told, and that's how you, you, you know that you're part of the pack in many different ways. One fateful day, Cole received a call about a badly injured dog that was affectionately nicknamed Teardrop. One day the pack had left the protected area. It was quite remarkable to say the least. Today is a big day for Teardrop. So the thing about this story is that wild dogs that are rehabilitated with their pack almost always recover. Whereas when you take the same injuries and you rehabilitate them by themselves, they often die. So this idea of how the tribe and my relationship with the tribe is part of my overall well-being, where separation out from the pack feels literally like form of death and for the Enneagram twos that is it I'll do anything to maintain the relationship the social two there and this is this is a remarkable veterinary breakthrough is when they learned that wild dogs um, can totally be rewilded and recover as long as they are rehabilitated with healthy members of their pack fascinating story and then lastly we are going to um look at a short video around the charms of the dog um and this is just a normal normal dog but look at who this dog won over in terms of becoming a good friend story of kumbali and kago a cheetah and a labrador who became the best of friends kumbali was the smallest and weakest cub in his litter the zoo staff were concerned about his health as he wasn't gaining weight Therefore, they decided to save his life by taking him under their care. But beyond physical health, it was important to teach the young cheetah how to be a cheetah, especially since he couldn't live with his family. The solution was found in Kago, a Labrador puppy rescued from a shelter. It is known that friendship with dogs helps cheetahs become more confident. Their first meeting was touching. The zoo staff decided to give this a chance. Initially cautious, Kumbali gradually softened under the fearless and playful Kago's approach. Soon, they began playing together, and their friendship quickly strengthened. Day by day, Kago and Kumbali learned from each other. The cheetah showed how to run fast, while the Labrador taught him that the world wasn't as scary as it seemed. When Kumbali was tired, he loved to curl up to sleep, embracing his new friend. Their friendship was special. As time passed, Kumbali grew stronger, but their games continued. They ran and rejoiced in life together, regardless of the differences in species and size. Hey, so that idea, dogs, as long as, you know, they're engaging with you, often they're trying to win your affection in different ways. And it's not necessarily that they're not loyal to their owners, but Sexual cues often get in trouble because they seem to be flirting, even though they're not flirting. They say, I'm just being friendly. I'm just being like a dog. Like, be my best friend. Give me, rub my head, do this thing. But I absolutely love how um, that kind of bonding, that intimate bonding here, that's cross-species bonding. The Enneagram 2 dog, I am of service. And of course, we know dogs can be um, guide dogs as well. They work with the blind and, and the visually impaired in different ways. So that active service and that deep bond that you see in the one-to-one -one twos, absolutely beautiful. Great, so let's look at Enneagram twos. Tell us what you think of your animals. 
Um, we're going on to our Enneagram threes, three ways of expressing vanity. Um, the self press three, so more like a, a horse. And here we're looking at horses um, that are in many ways, they can, they can enjoy competing, they can work hard, but they're wanting to add value in many different ways. And um, one of the jokes that one of my self press three uh, friends told recently he said, the way you know you're a self press three is you set really ambitious goals for yourself. You tell no one about it. And then you smash them. And you secretly feel a bit superior to everyone else. But it's all in secret. So self press three, um, not the usual ways of expressing vanity the unusual counter type, counter vanity. So works hard, often looks more like an Enneagram one. Our social threes are more like the springbok, according to our rangers. And what you see there is a springbok that is uh, showing a behavior called pronking. And that's basically showing off by doing ridiculous jumps and lifting some of their hair <laughs> and just going, yeah, this is me, this is me. I'm um, absolutely beautiful. Um, so there we've got that. And once again, they are also herd animals. And then we've got the bower bird, which is not found in our part of the world. I had to go look this bird up. So I want to show you about uh, something about the bower bird and the extremes to which they go in order to attract a mate. And the sexual three is often called masculinity or femininity is like, I am going to be the the most beautiful version of me so I can tr attract a mate that eventually will stand me in good stead. And let's find out a little bit more about these different animals, especially the bowerbird, those of you that aren't familiar with that bird. So I'm going to just show you a little bit of the horse clip. Um, and it's just to give you that idea. It's not necessarily about competing with others. It's competing against myself and that idea of really enjoying adding value. And um, yeah, just the freedom that comes with uh, being myself and expressing myself to my fullest in many ways. Beautiful horse running on the beach. Give you a sense. What we know is Enneagram 3s want to that they're adding value. And most of us are fairly familiar with the horse, so we're not going to go too much deeper into that. So I am then also going to show you a little just of the springbuck pronking. Now, in South Africa, our one of our special um, sports teams, the the our rugby team that are an amazing sports team with amazing leaders are called the Springboks. And so there's a little bit extra of that competitiveness that comes from uh, the association we have with that in our country. Springboks are a type of antelope found in the southern regions of Africa, particularly in South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, and Zimbabwe. They are known for their incredible speed and agility, which make them one of the most impressive animals to watch in the wild. The springbok is a medium-sized antelope, standing at about 75 to 100 centimeters tall at the shoulder and weighing around 27 to 42 kilograms. They are easily recognizable and athleticism. The word pronk is derived from the Afrikaans language meaning to show off. This behavior is typically seen during the mating season when males will compete for the attention of females by showing off their strength and agility. Springboks are also incredibly fast runners capable of reaching speeds of up to 90 kilometers an hour or 55 miles per hour. This speed allows them to quickly escape predators such as cheetahs and lions, which are among their main natural enemies in the wild. Despite their speed and agility, springboks are herbivores, feeding on a variety of grasses and shrubs. So, social three, I am an antelope, and I genuinely think I've got this in a race against a lion and a big predator. 
So there you go. That is an interesting way of looking at the vanity of the Enneagram threes. And then that like behavior, that showing off behavior that um, is associated with some of the Enneagram three. So now the bowerbird, which is all, everything you're going to see now is all about attracting a mate. And um, yeah, let's look at it. And in particular, pay attention. So sometimes people say that the sexual subtypes have like intense eyes. Um, this is very true of the Enneagram threes um, in particular. Uh, but let's look at what's happening to this bowerbird's eyes. Another visitor. This time, it's a female. This is just where he wants her. Time to begin the show. Okay, so that's the eye-catching behavior of the sexual three. They put on a whole show to attract a mate, and if you keep watching it, they bring blueberries, so lots of blue things. And, um, pick up a lot of shiny things on the way to also... Um, attract the perfect partner and they can get quite aggressive with the other male bowerbirds that come along that try and trump them if you've never heard of a bowerbird go check them out fascinating fascinating creatures great so we are enneagram threes tell us what you think about everything from your horse to your springbok to your bowerbird um we are moving on to our enneagram fours that are known as the more unique people on the Enneagram. They want to establish their uniqueness in different ways, but a little bit attached to suffering. And so the self praise for is the quietly suffering for. They can look like Enneagram ones in many ways. They just grin and bear how the bad hand that life has um, dealt them. They continue lumbering on, not necessarily as openly sensitive as the social and the one-to-one -one fours. The social fours, I have to actually explain a little bit because most of our rangers gave me this explanation. As they said, sometimes when you're driving through the park, there's an old lonely male baboon sitting next to the side of the road and he looks like it's a bad day. And this is, social four is called the openly suffering version of four. And there they sit. And if you stop next to them in your car and you look at them, they kind of look away and it's like, oh, life is so tough. And uh, one of the rangers said, sometimes you can kind of pretend that you're like throwing something to them or whatever. And it's like you're shooting them and they go, oh, it's like openly suffering, very dramatic. Um, not so much the baboons having fun all the time, but it's the lonely male baboon looking as though life is just really, really tough. And then we've got our one-to-one -one fours that are like the weirdest creature on this planet, the platypus. No one knows why those weird, um, the weird ensemble of body parts, why that actually, um, how that ended up in one animal together. And platy platypi we're around with the dinosaurs. And this is part of the Enneagram 4 is we look to the past so much that we sometimes don't live sufficiently in the here and now. And the platypus is actually, so the sexual 4 we say is the, I make other people suffer with me. So self press 4, long suffering, social 4, openly suffering and melancholy. And then the one to one 4, if I suffer, you suffer with me. And what we have here with the platypus is they have these um, wicked uh, claws that they uh, were a growth. It's almost like a horn on a, on a part of their body that's full of poison. And if you try and compete with them, you get the poison from this weird thing. So I, I will take you down with you. You'll suffer with me is what we get here in the four space. So um, just very briefly, let's look at some of... The videos here, we're not going to look at the 
um, uh, all of them for long, but it gives you an idea of the different creatures. Um, let's look at the pangolin first. Here we go. This is a male tree pangolin. He is six months old. Critically endangered and under-researched, the tree pangolin is a mammalian species like no other. Found throughout Asia and Africa, pangolins can be traced back six million years, meaning they lived amongst dinosaurs. Only tree pangolins use their long claws to climb on trees and branches in an endless search for prey. Baby pangolins, like the one here, get around by riding their mother's tails. Though they have poor eyesight and hearing, their strong sense of smell and elastic tongue allows them to catch a meal mostly ants and termites. When the pangolin senses danger, it will curl up into Right, so pangolins, extreme threat, they just keep going on, they curl into a ball, they keep going, but they are slightly awkward and defenseless. Being a pangolin is hard in this day and age, but they just go in the protective shell that can make them um, look a little bit less sensitive than our other Enneagram uh, fours. The baboon, I'm just going to give you a short video. I really struggled to find our lone male baboon clip, but I found one. So here we go. Um, and here you have a sense of a little bit of that, uh, life is tough that we get from the lone male baboon. Oh! Oh! There you go. No one understands me. I'm just going to turn my back on you and continue my suffering. Just leave me alone. There's a little bit of a bark. We know the Enneagram 4 is are some of our reactive types. So there we go. Um, and then let's just get to know the platypus a little bit for our uh, weird and wonderful sexual fours. Here we go. I will take it forward to the claw a little bit. Ian's thought it was a hoax when they first saw drawings of the peculiar creature. But make no mistake, this oddball animal's no joke. It's a one-of-a-kind all-terrain species combining three animals in one. And it goes from cute to killer in an instant. At first glance, they make no sense. From the Yet what makes the platypus truly incredible is how it remakes itself, transforming from swimmer to sp printer, bird imposter to mammal, and back again. I, I don't know exactly where that piece of the clip is, but you get the sense. So Enneagram 4 is often say, I've lost myself. I have to find my authentic self again. And that's that continuous evolution of the Enneagram 4 platypus. And they go from looking just like a weird animal to being incredibly vicious in a very short space of time with that little claw, poisonous claw that it carries on its body. And um, Beatrice Chestnut often says that the sexual fours are the most angry of all the types on the Enneagram. And that's that thing. If I have to suffer, you sure as hell suffering with me. So Enneagram fours, tell us what you think about your weird and wonderful animals. 
And now we're into the head center. And in the head center, we've got the Enneagram fives, different ways of con um, protecting my castle, uh, different ways of wanting to understand. So the self praise five, which is the most private of the Enneagram fives, absolutely every group I've worked with, the Rangers have said they like leopards. Um, very private, um, really do their own thing. And I think if you want to take it to its most unhealthy, the self praise five can be like the snow leopard, which I think is the least um, photographed or videoed animal in the world. It lives in the Himalayas. And the snow leopard is one of the videos I'll show you here. The social five is uh, the, the owl, a symbol of knowledge and wisdom. Definitely a creature that loves the night a lot more than the day. And um, many ways in which we say the social five is the totem. I'm kind of um, in some way trying to find my tribe of other knowers. And that's uh, more of the uh, maybe the symbology of the, the owl than its actual behavior here. And then our one-to-one -one special fives are like the clip springer. A tiny, amazing antelope species. They mate for life. They um very protective of their young as well. They live in very remote places and they're not necessarily integrated with the rest of the animal kingdom so much. They keep to themselves, but incredibly close to their mates. So the more romantic, unusual version of the Enneagram 5 where my castle has space for a partner and maybe for my family. And they'll get to come in, but the rest of the world we keep at bay. So let's look at the snow leopard. Um, there are amazing documentaries about snow leopard. If you want to look at that, also just leopard in general. If you want to um, find out more about this very solitary animal, um, solitary hunter as well. Um, there we go. So the ghost of the mountain, the snow leopards. So the snow leopards are so private, they don't even know how many they are in the world, but they're known as the ghost of the mountain. And out of sight, out of mind, I'm private. I'm here by myself. I'm very happy. I'll come out when I need you. Don't worry. Uh, the only way we know so much about snow leopard now is because of camera traps that are in the Himalayas. Then if we look at our social fives, I just have a quick this one's a little bit of a fun video around um, the con uh, connotations we have with social five. So let's look at that. Social spokes owl for WGU. I use my gift of wisdom to enlighten people. You're very wise. <laughs> yes, but it's the graduates of WGU who are truly the wise ones. They chose a university that's honored for excellence and earned a degree that's respected by employers. Impressive. But can they do this? <laughs> no employer wants that. Look out, coming back around. Online, nonprofit, and so. Little bit of that Enneagram 5 arrogance around knowledge that's maybe in play here as well. And uh, then our last of our Enneagram 5s, the clip springer, which is maybe, especially for people not from South Africa, something that you might not know as well. So let me just share a little bit more about them. Um, it's really amazing where one of the one of the special places in my life is a place in the mountains. And for about 10 years, there was a, a, a couple of uh, clip springer that slept most nights under the same rock. Um, and the two of them moved everywhere together. When you saw the one, you could always look to find the other. So here. Symbolic. 
Connor's landscape is spectacular. These huge, arid, rocky outcrops create breathtaking vistas. But they are also home to an amazingly agile antelope. The Clipspringer earned its name for its athletic abilities. In Afrikaans, it literally means rock jumper. They have a very unique hoof structure, which enables them to stand on the very tips of their hooves. Teamed with amazing balance, this allows them to find footholds on the sheerest of cliffs. Clip springers mate for life and are usually spotted in pairs or with their offspring, which may stay with its parents for up to a year. Clip springers mainly eat the fruits and flowers of bushes and succulents. The family group or pair will stay close together while browsing, taking turns between eating and watching out for danger. When you only reach 58 centimetres tall at maturity, eagles, caracals, leopards and jackals, practically any opportunistic hunter, will see you as a tasty snack. Clip Springer territories are pretty small and they may stay on the same rocky outcrop their entire lives. There we go. So I love that, that image of the Clip Springer and they zoom out and you see they really... <laughs> on their own in the middle of nowhere uh but the two of them move together um and that's uh the one to one five the more romantic of the fives confidant you stay with me here in the middle of nowhere and all will be well enneagram fives give us an idea of what you think of the animals that are associated with your type let's look at our enneagram sixes um very different Claudia Naranjo always said that if you don't understand the subtypes of the Enneagram 6, you'll never understand Enneagram 6 uh, because they're so, so different. So the self press 6, we all want safety inside Enneagram 6. So what are the ways in which we get to safety and deal with our fear? The self press 6 goes, be in a group because those crazy predators will eat from the outside and you'll be safe in the middle. But if we bond and we all together all the time, we'll be safer than on our own. So that's how I maintain my safety is uh, by being warm, caring, loving. I can look a little bit like an Enneagram 2 or an Enneagram 9 in many ways. Then our social sixes are more like the buffalo herd. And the different ways in which they maintain safety is through the rules of how the herd operates together. But they also, Naranjo called them the cold six. So there are certain rules. They're not as warm and fluffy as our meerkats that we have at self press six. They, you know, you have to be much more careful with your social sixes and they can be quite oriented um, towards rules and regulations as a way of keeping safety. And then our one-to-one -one six, um, Naranjo called the hot six. So the more hot under the collar, here's the thing that's going to help me deal with fear and uncertainty is by trusting myself and myself alone. And here we have the very interesting and um, resourceful jackal, um, perhaps a little bit more like coyote. And we do remember that Enneagram 6 in sometimes is called the devil's advocate. So there's something contrarian around the Enneagram 6 energy here. Uh, but the jackal and the buffalo and the meerkat, very different animals. And it's because the subtypes are so different. Now, let's take a look at our meerkat. They are really interesting, cute, peculiar um, animals and fascinating to watch. You definitely see that alertness, that like, where's the next danger going to come from that you get inside the Enneagram 6 from the meerkats. Um, as you get to know them. Here we go.
uh, you call a group of meerkats a mob, which is very cute. And you see that they are so alert that they can see an eagle flying a thousand feet away. They're always scanning the horizon. And then they give these calls and then the whole lot of them scurry into the hole. And then they come out again, they peek if it's safe and back into the hole. They're incredibly busy animals. And generally our Enneagram sixes are a little bit like that. So our buffalo herd, let's just get a sense of that. Um, and let me get to our sharing function here. Here we go. This small buffalo calf, just four months old, follows his mother through Zambia's Luangwa Valley. He's part of a huge herd, 1,000 strong, made up of 50 families, all sticking together for protection. There's safety in numbers, but keeping such an enormous group together is hard work. Getting separated could be disastrous, especially for the young buffalo. But the herd has a strategy to maintain cohesion. A few go up front as trusted pathfinders, leading the others to fresh grass and water. These aren't necessarily the most dominant or oldest animals, but it's always the same select few that take on this role. Where these buffaloes go, the others follow. But the level of organization goes further than that. A calf is kept safe in the center along with his mother and the other breeding females. More expendable bachelor males and the sick or injured are pushed to the periphery. So we know Enneagram 6, there's often the sense of duty, of loyalty that goes with the social 6. So um, also take your role, play your role, whatever your role is, stick to that. And heuristics. Um, or regulation or rules that somehow give us the orientation towards safety. And these can come from many different spaces. And then lastly, let's look at the jackal. Um, and here, um, the interesting thing about the jackal, this is a jackal that's hunting seal pups and it's only relying on its own wit to be safe in quite an unsafe set of circumstances and to figure it out. So more of that cunning, uh, how, are we, how are we going to make this work that we get from them? Just show you a little bit of this. Jackal goes out looking for a fresh meal when it's available. After exhausting the stock of weak pups, he tries his hand at some more boisterous youngsters. But it's not as simple as it looks. Seals have strong jaws a very thick skin, and above all, are very light sleepers. So the counterphobic six goes towards the danger, goes by themselves, gets all these strategies. If you keep watching that, you'll see they go and roll in awful things to camouflage their smell. And there's this like, I'm going to figure this out. No one else is going to do this for me. I'm going to figure this out, rely on no one and nothing else, just your own wit and quite rebellious against authority and will take on things as well as a way of saying, I'm going to take on the authority figure to check that they are safe and trustworthy. And then lastly, we're going to look at our Enneagram sevens, three ways of expressing gluttony. Our self press sevens are our resourceful little monkeys that get whatever they need 
in very industrious ways and they figure out tools and who knows what else. The social sex here, we have the dolphin. So they live in a pod. They're very caring, playful in the group. But here, social seven is also sacrificing themselves so others can have um, more freedom. They're willing to take some bad things. And we're going to look at some dolphins that are um, willing to take the stings of puffer fish um, as a way um, of also kind of going into the pain in some way to get to the pleasure. So it's the unusual version of the seven in service of something, in service of freedom, I'm willing to take some. Where the monkeys and our little squirrels are more pain avoidant. And there we have our squirrel, um, incredibly resourceful, um, most rose-colored, resourceful of all of the Enneagram Sevens, rose-tinted glasses, nothing's going to keep me out, runs into the traffic without blinking because everything's going to work out okay, right? So that's what the the one to one sevens often experience. So let's just get a quick look at our resourceful monkeys, maybe first and foremost. Um, and the keepers of the castle always know what to do or how to make the pain go away. In Southern Thailand, long-tailed macaques are sometimes known as Ling Ta Lei. Sea monkeys. And it's not hard to see why. But this isn't just about having a good time. Like their temple visiting cousins, they've got a clever plan. They've adapted their lives to the rhythm of the sea. And twice a day, low tide reveals a feast. Nutritious shellfish. Trouble is, shells are tough to crack. But ever resourceful, these macaques have found a smart solution. They've worked out that raw, perfect shellfish hammers. Okay. So often the self-praised sevens are called the more pragmatic of the sevens. They have ways of getting what they want through being practical. Um, and a lot of what they want has to do and what they focus on, what makes them more anxious is resourcing. So there you have a very interesting adaptive strategy. Let's look at our dolphins um, and the puffer fish that sting and are poisonous here. When attacked, puffer fish release a neurotoxin. In high doses, it can kill, but in small doses, it has a narcotic effect. seems to be affecting the dolphins. They appear totally blissed out by the whole experience. There we have it, taking the pain to get to the pleasure, allowing the puff fish to sting me. And that's the, the service of the Enneagram 7 social subtype in order for me to experience some of the, the pleasure that comes with my subtype. And then lastly, let's just quickly look at the very idealistic, resourceful, you're never going to get me down squirrels. There are amazing squirrel escape videos so you can always take a look at more of them. It's a rabbit hole that I do not recommend for anyone who wants to have a life. I've got on that rabbit hole. Doug has decided to put their memory and cognitive abilities to the test. The maze. 
there's only one way through. So the squirrels will have to ignore the dead ends and learn the right route. So remember, sevens are head types. So they are using their mental abilities to escape pain, to create a better future. Nothing's going to keep me in. So the squirrel is definitely a head type, but it wants the best out of life in a variety of different ways. So I know we can spend a lot more time talking about this. I hope you really enjoyed the presentation. And what I suggested at the start is you can... Um, build your own totem pole of your trifix. So just here's my version. I'm a four, followed by an eight, followed by a five. So I've got platypus in my feeling center, black rhino in my gut center, and cliff springer in the head center. And how do these three animals live together? A really interesting combination of being aggressive, weird, and strange and a little bit defensive in many different ways, together with the romantic heart, wanting to just escape somewhere into the middle of the mountains with the people that are closest to me. And so those of you that know me, that is the best explanation I've had for my personality so far. Uh, look at your totem pole and see if it makes sense for you. Thanks so much for a wonderful session. We look forward to seeing you at Supervision next time. Uh, around complexity and how that supports us in our maturation. Cherise, thanks so much for today. And why don't we all unmute and just make an animal noise all together and we can just hear each other's voices and say goodbye together. Unmute. And at the count of three, we just go, bye everyone. Oh, bye. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Free. Thanks for today. Bye.